kind of caught up. So we, we pick up in chapter 6, verses 1 through 13 kind of tells you what 14 about. So we have Gideon. Gideon is an Israelite, and it, it talks about how the Israelite did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they're sinning again. They fall back in sin, and then the Lord comes, and he helps them. So they cry out, Lord, these Canaanites are coming. They're taking all of our food. They're taking all of our resources. And, and, they, and they're leaving us hungry and famished, in a sense, without trying to read everything to you, trying to give you the, the smart notes. So these Canaanites are coming, but they don't even live they don't even live in the land. Midianites don't even live there. They only come when Israel is doing a sowing. So they already sit the harvest, and now it's time for the food to rise and the crops to grow. So these Midianites, they come, and they take everything. They take everything, even the goats and the sheep, and they leave Israel hiding. They're in mountains. They're in caves. The Bible says they're in strongholds hiding from the Midianites who has oppressed them for the last seven years. So seven years, this goes on. And on the seventh year, the people cry out, Lord, save us. But the thing is, people, when you look at the story, Israel is asking God to save them from the consequences. They're not asking God to remove them from their sin. They're saying, Lord, our sin caused us to live in distress. Our sin caused us to live in fear. Our sin caused us to go in hiding. We're not asking you to fix that. We just ask you to, to fix the consequences. Because sometimes we can get so caught up in our sin that our vision is warded. We, they think the Midianite are the bad guys, but the problem is them. It's their sin. That's the problem. It's not the Midianite. The Midianite are the consequences of their sin. But yet they're not praying, God, help us walk out of our sin. They're just saying, Lord, we're comfortable with what we're doing. We just don't want them to ravish in our stuff. And that's how we get as people. We get so comfortable in our sin that we can't even pray correctly. We can tell God to remove a situation, remove a circumstance from us, has nothing to do with God. It's our sin that puts us in that place. So what Israel failed to realize is, Lord, save us from the consequence, but don't take us out of our sin. Have you ever been in that place where you get so comfortable in something that you think the thing that is causing a thorn in your side is the problem? And the thorn in your side is to cause you to reflect back to God. Lord, I'm sick of working seven jobs. And God has said, well, if you worked the first job I told you to do, you want to work seven jobs. Lord, I don't understand why my relationship is not working out, why it's not going the way I think it's going. Why is it causing me all this pain and heartache? Well, if you loved your wife like, the, like God loved the church, it wouldn't be a problem. You know, if your wife submitted to your husband, it wouldn't be a problem. It's not the consequences that's the problem. The consequences are sit to point us back to Christ. So this is what Israel failed to realize. They're, they're crying out to God to save them for the Midianites, but they're not crying out to God to restore them back to him. So we find Gideon threshing wheat. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. If anybody know anything about a wine press, a wine press is like a, it's, it's, a, it's like a ditch where they will put grapes in. They will step on the grapes and the grapes juice will fall into another cellar. And in that cellar, they will get the juice, form it, and it will turn into wine. But if you ever know anything about threshing wheat, threshing wheat is supposed to be done in an open space. So now you have Gideon hiding because of the fear that was caused by their sin in a place of uncomfortable. Because when we're deep in our sin, it caused things to be harder on us. So threshing wheat wasn't never supposed to be as difficult as Gideon was making it. Because he was so fearful, he was doing the wine press. He said, Lord, I'm trying to hide from the midnight, so let me go into a wine press and thresh wheat. That's not even, that don't even go together. Because we can be so engrossed in our sin, we can be so caught up in the things that are comfortable, all we're doing is making things harder on us that God never called for. All we're doing is making things twice as hard where we're supposed to live in freedom, we're supposed to live in abundance, we're supposed to live in joy and peace, 
But when we're engrossed in sin, when we're far away from God, the provision stops. And what we see in Judges chapter 6, the first verses, is God's provision is off the people. He says, I still love you, but your sin has taken away your provision. So his hands is off the people, and Midianite is able to come and just do whatever they want, oppress the people. And now for seven years, family, for seven years this goes on to the point where they are starving and they're crying out to God. So God hears them, and God sends an angel. And the Bible says the angel is actually Jehovah himself. And the angel is talking to Gideon. And he says, go. He said, mighty man, God is, God is using you, pretty much. God is calling you. And Gideon first thing he says, well, where, where were you back six years ago when this first started? Where, where were you when all this started? Where were you yesterday when I was doing this? And the Lord has to remind him, I was with Moses when he brought the people out of Egypt. I was here and I was there, but it was your sin that caused this. And the angels kind of puts him back in this place and said, it was you and your people who caused this consequence to happen, not I. Gideon cries out and he put the blame back on Christ, like, where were you? And that's what we, when we're in a, in, a, in a place of sin, in a place of darkness, and we can't see clearly, we always find the fault on everybody else but ourselves. We're always pointing the blame at others. Lord, if this person did this, and, and if that person did this, and if this was only right, then this will be made good. And the angel just points it back, no, it's your sin. You guys fell away from me. You guys start worshiping false idols. You guys start doing things I, call, I commanded you not to do. So now we, we have Gideon, and Gideon, we don't know much about Gideon. We do know the Bible tells us that his father is one of the worshipers of Baal. His father has a statue. So Gideon comes from this, this house of this family that worship false idols. But yet, you know, Gideon is a hard worker because he's threshing wheat. The text says that he most likely sent his father back home while he worked because his father was old. So he's caring, he's compassionate. And when he's questioning Yahweh, he's saying, where were you and weren't you the same God that did this and this? So he knows the history. He knows of God. But the, the Bible don't really tells us that he's a devout Christian or he's this, but God chooses him anyway. God chooses Gideon anyway, despite Gideon's weakness. So in verse 14, it says, excuse me, verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So what was Gideon's response? Who are you talking to? Who is this mighty warrior? You can, can you not see me? I'm hiding. I'm afraid of my life. And you said, I'm a mighty warrior? He said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, because the Lord sees in us what we can't see in ourselves. When God is calling us, he's not saying, I need you, or you're the only one for this position. A calling of God is just an invitation of our participation. He's inviting us to participate in his work. It's not about you're the only one who can fix this. You're the only one who can handle it. That is not the case. God is God and God alone. But he invites Gideon to participate in the freedom and the release of God's people. And Gideon's first response after he says, mighty warrior, is, but sir, a rebuttal because when God calls us and he is calling us to an action our first thing is to think of how we're disqualified of how we don't meet up the people of Israel was praying, was praying for a savior was praying for a warrior Gideon was a coward when God was calling the people out of Egypt who's bringing the people out of Egypt he needed a spokesman he chose a stutterer when God was creating the earth, he said, Noah, I want you to build a boat. People needed a captain because he was restarting civilization. They got a drunk. Many times when God calls and, and calls us into commission, he's calling the least qualified person because it's not about us, it's about his glory. God called Gideon 
to restore Israel from the hands of the Midianites who were powerful, strong, mighty, and numerous. And he go and finds a coward hiding in a wine press. What that tells us, our qualification is out the window. It doesn't matter what we are qualified, what we have. But God says, I chose you. They are praying for a warrior, and God goes and finds a coward. How good is our God? And Gideon is not perfect. Gideon is unsure of himself. Gideon don't know what's left and what's right because as you continue to read the story, you see Gideon asked God three times for a sign. He wanted to make sure God is calling him. Well, you sure? Okay, make this fleece dry and everything around it wet. God does it. All right, Lord, I, I, I know you did it, but excuse me. Okay, make this ground wine and the fleece wet or dry. Okay, all right, I'll do it. He did it. All right, Lord, it, all these things he's asking for God because he's so unsure of himself. That is not a qualification of a warrior. That is not a qualification of a leader. However, God see fit to, I'm going to use you anyway. So family, we, the first thing we have to understand is when God is calling us, when he's inviting us to participate in the work he's doing, throw your qualification out the window. Don't think about, Lord, I don't have this. Lord, I, I don't know what to do. When God first, when I felt God first called me to ministry, I, I knew he made a mistake. I knew it. I'm, I mean, the dreams, the, the confirmation, I knew it was a mistake because I'm not qualified. I said, Lord, I don't have no skills. I don't have no training. Both of my parents are drug and alcoholics. I was in foster care. I was sexually molested as a child. I got no education. I'm from the projects. I got no resources. Lord, you ain't calling me. There is nobody in my family that is saved that can that even show me how to be saved. Ain't no way you calling me. But all he said was go. God doesn't make mistakes. There was a problem and God chose us to be an extension of him. This is, this is all a calling is an extension of Christ. So right now, in this, in this world that we're living in, and the things that's going on in the family dynamics, God may be calling you. No qualifications at all. He may be calling you to restore the dynamics of your family, to restore the dynamics of your bloodline, to break generational curse. Even for the world, he may be calling you forth and calling you out. But one thing for sure, if God has called you, he will confirm it. There was no doubt in Gideon's mind that Yahweh was speaking to him. He knew it was God. Nehemiah had an inkling. Nehemiah had a disturbance in his spirit. Something needs to be done. Lord, make a way. And God blessed him. But sometimes God would just straight up call you. There's an issue. There's a problem. And I'm choosing you. And what was so fantastic about the, the, the verbiage in which he used in verse 14, says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. Go in the strength you have. In layman's terms, all he's simply saying was, go with what you got. Stop telling me what you need. Stop telling me what you don't have, but go with what you have. And if all you have is a servant's heart, go. And God can work with that. If all you have is a mouthpiece, go, and God would work with that. If all you have is you just know how to work with your hands. You don't like people. You don't like groups. You don't like doing, you just know how to work with it. Go. Because God can use that for his glory. And when God calls, he calls the most unqualified person he can find for that situation. Because he gets the glory. So Gideon may not have all the qualifications of a leader. Matter of fact, he had none. Gideon was just a, a person. But the scripture says Gideon had the might of the humble. Threshing wheat on the witness floor, God can use that. 
Gideon had the mind of the caring, but because he cared about the low place of Israel. God can use that. Gideon had the might of knowledge because he knew God did great things in the past. God can use that. Gideon had the might of spiritually hungry because he wanted to see God do great things again. God can use that. Gideon had the might of the teachable because he listened to what the angel of the Lord said. And God definitely can use that. Gideon had the might of the weak and God's strength is perfected in weakness. That's 2 Corinthians 2 and 12 and 19. The first thing, family, is that when God calls us, it's not about our qualifications. It's not about what we can offer him. God is just, we're just being an extension of who he is. And family, there's a lot of work to be done, not just in the world, but in our homes and our bloodline. Family, God is still in the calling business, and he has called some people in this, in this building. Age don't matter. Gender, race, economic, prospect, none of that matters when God is calling you. If you could be teachable, if you could be humble, if you're caring, God can use that. The second thing God showed me as I was studying was, it's not about us. We are not the main characters. So when God calls and we feel like God is calling us, the first thing, one of the first things we do is, okay, Lord, well, how am I supposed to fix this problem? We put it on us. We trying to find solutions to a God problem. We're not able to do so. We're not God. So when God is calling you to use you as a resource, don't make it about you. Don't think if you don't do it, it won't get done. Don't think... Out of all the people, I must be the best because God called me. We have to remember it's never about us. It's always about God. We're just an extension. The toe can never say to the body, if it wasn't for me, y'all can't do nothing. The failure can never say to the body, if I don't work, y'all don't work. And a lot of times we, we get that pride in us, and, and that's what calls us to go off track. Every single one of these judges in the book of Judges fell off track because of pride in some sense. God called them, they got big-headed, and thought it was always about them, and then they fell off. The calling of God is never about the person. Because the Bible says, Israel cried out. Israel, the, God's people. God said, you are a solution. You are a help to a problem of the people. This is not about you. The thing is, Gideon was one of the people that was crying out. He just had no idea that God was going to use him. So when we're praying, we're crying out to God for a, a situation or a problem, don't think that you won't be the solution to that problem. God sent Gideon to free Israel out of the oppression of Midianites. He didn't choose Gideon because he wanted Gideon to be on a poster. He didn't choose Gideon because he wanted Gideon to be in commercials. He just chose him as an extension of him. Gideon, this is not about you. This is about the work I'm going to do in you for my people. So if we don't understand that the calling of God on our life isn't about us, we would never amount to what God is calling us to amount to. Because we're always going to think, how can I solve this problem? How can I get this done? Instead of saying, Lord, how are you going to do it? I'm here empty and hollow. How are you going to do it? And when we're in that state, that's when God does his best work. Because anytime we remove our vision, our eyesight from the Lord, we walk into the pride. We walk into stumbling. We just begin to just get off rail. Every, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work when you think you're the key. You're the star player. God is. He always will be. The calling of God on your life is not about you. There's a group of people out there that need to see God, and God just chose you as an extension. There's a people in your family that needs deliverance. There's people in your church that needs help, and God is just using you as a reflection of him because he is high on the throne. He said, I can't come down. I'm using you anyway because that's going to reflect me and bring them back to me. Because a lot of times when we get in that 
leaders are, are people that's called in that state. They look in the mirror and they see themselves instead of seeing Jesus. And a lot of times when you see these, these pastors nowadays fall into sin or fall into this blasphemy and goes astray, it's because they got too comfortable with getting the pats on the back. Oh, pastor, that was amazing. Oh, man, that sermon was incredible. You're so articulate. You're so creative. You're so this. And then it begins to be more about them and less about God. Family is not about us. It is not about you. Because when you look in the scripture, the Bible says, God told Gideon, I will be with you. God told Noah, I will be with you. God told Moses, I will be with you. So everything that was walking out, everything that was doing, it was God in them, using them. So one of the first things that the Lord told Gideon to do, he says, Gideon, Go to your father's house, tear down that statue, and replace, build an altar for the God. Because sometimes when God is calling us, we got to get the gods and idols out of our own home first. We got to go in our own house, in our own hearts, and get the idols out. Before he sent him to do anything to the Midianites, he said, go to your house, go to your father's house, and take down that idol. And Gideon, not being the special he was, Gideon said, okay, I'll do it, Lord. But well, he did it at night. Because you don't have to be perfect to be used by God. You just got to be willing. Gideon said, I would go, but I'm going to do it at night and I'm still scared. Then you ain't take that out of me, Lord. So no matter what God is calling you to do, do it in the strength you have. If you're scared, do it anyway. If you're clueless, do it anyway. If, you're, if, you, if, you, if you don't know how, do it anyway. Because the Lord is with you. And when the Lord is with you, he's instructing you. Because what he told Gideon, step by step by step by step. Do this first, then do this, then build an altar, then replace this altar here. Gideon had to guess about nothing. Because it wasn't about Gideon. If it was about us, God would say, here's a problem, go fix it. But God says, here's a problem, here's how I'm going to fix it using you. When he told Noah to build the ark, he said, Noah, build it this high, build it this long, build it this many rooms, you have this many months. When he called Moses to tell the people to get out of Egypt, he said, go to the Pharaoh on this day, tell him this. When he tells you this, you say this. Go back home, wait the next day. Go back to Pharaoh, tell him this. His heart is going to, nobody had to guess. God is not concerned with how much you know, he just want to make sure you're willing to be used. If we're an extension, if we're a, a piece of his handiwork, then why don't we understand that God can call us and use us at any time? When there's a problem and we're praying for it, why don't we believe that God can use us? We have to understand, one, our qualifications don't matter. It's, primarily the most unqualified people that got called for a job. Two, it's not about us. It's about God and the work he does in us. When God is in us, he instructs us step by step to where we never have to guess. Not saying it's going to be easy, family. Not saying it's going to be comfortable or make you feel good, but you never got to guess with God. When he's calling you for a bigger purpose, the work is already done, and you just got to step it out. He's going to tell you, sow this amount of money in this place. Get in your car, go here. Park here, wait. Talk to this person. Tell them this. Support them in this. Say this. Don't go here. The work is done. We just got to be bold enough to do it. And we don't, have to, we don't have to be perfect. Nobody was perfect. Family, this is, I hope this eases your burden of your call to where you realize I've been called and I've been hesitant about going. And I hope what God has shared with me and I'm sharing with you will ease that burden. I don't have to figure this out. I don't have to be alone. I just have to go. And the last thing that God showed me, 
and then we're going to go. We're going to dismiss and pray and go. Is when you're walking in a calling of God, it is vital that you walk with God. It is vital that you spend time in prayer. It is vital that you spend time in fasting. It is vital that you spend time seeking his face. It is vital. Because without it, we are nothing. We are nothing. Gideon was, just sticking to the text, Gideon was scared out of his mind, of his meeting, and then the Lord is saying, face them. You don't think he went back and sought God and, and sat at his face, Lord, help me. The Bible describes the Midianite vast and numerous on camelbacks. And it wasn't just the Midianite, it was the people of the East. They would come in numerous numbers and the Lord is, you want me to tackle all them? You know how many times he had to go to the Lord and sit in prayer, fast and pray? Moses had the task of speaking to the Pharaoh. You know how much power the Pharaoh have? And each and every day, Moses had to go back to the Pharaoh. God said, let my people go. God said, if you don't, this is going to happen. Pharaoh says, no. He goes back. You think he just watched TV or went in place? No. He got right back in the face of God. Father, what is it I supposed to do next? What, what do you want me to do next? Because if we're not seeking God continuously, the Bible says pray without ceasing. Seek God because this call is not your calling. It's God's work through you. And how can we know what to do if we're not listening to the person telling us how to do it? How can we deliver? How can we restore? How can we set free God's captive people if we're not listening to the man? God says, I never left you, nor will I ever. But you have to spend time with me. You have to come forward and seek me. You got to pray. You got to fast. You got to cut out the world and the noises so that I can instruct you of how to be victorious. A lot of times, family, we, I don't know why we do it. We just stop. God calls us. We answer. We go. God does something miraculous in us. We see somebody get saved. We see a, a break, a break free. We see people getting change released. And for some reason, we, we stop praying. Or we stop seeking God as much as we were. We just, man, Lord, I don't, I don't have to study as hard. I, I think I got it. We get comfortable. And the Lord said, no, you don't. I see what's around the corner. You just see what's in front of you. Family, we have to get back to a, a season of prayer because the call on your life is too great for you to mess up because I need you. He needs you. They need you. It's a call on your life that is too great, too mighty for you to mess up. And when you're not seeking God and you're not truly being broken from your chains or delivered from your hiccups, Sometimes you stop the process of the people getting free. Somebody in your generation, somebody in your bloodline is looking at you because you're the only God they see. You got some nephew, some niece, somebody along the generation, that when you walk by, they just be like, man, that person knows God. And you don't even know God is using you. You can't even tell because you don't even see the fruit. But the roots are being planted, the roots are growing. In the minute we stop because of hardship or discomfort, it's the minute we slow down somebody else's breakthrough. Family, everybody in this room is here for the next person. My life is not for Carlin. My life may be for Ena, my wife. My life may be for my children. My life may be for the next man. And if I don't stay, prayed up. If I don't stay seeking Christ, I can hinder somebody else's growth. So what Gideon had to do was stay prayed up because he had a big battle ahead of him. Gideon had to face the army of the Midianites. And how God used him was God was like, hey, 
calls some people, y'all about to go to war. Gideon does exactly as he is told. And guess what? God says, wait, we got too many people. Send some home. And Gideon's like, God, they got a million people. We only got this amount. Too much. Because I don't want nobody coming back saying they defeated them in their might. They're going to see that I, Jehovah, God of God, I did it. Scale back. Even at the water hole, Gideon's still listening. He's still seeking God. Hey, watch how they drink that water. If they cup it, keep them. If they drink it like a dog, let them go. Gideon went from a huge army to 300 and defeated the biggest army he ever seen. If we are called to be conquerors and, and to defeat the enemy, we have to lean into Christ. We have to daily. We have to know that it ain't about our qualifications. It's not about the, the status, our education, our financial status, our wealth, our, where we come from. None of that matters. Because whatever God called you to is probably the weakest thing that you're good at. God is with you. It's not about you. It's about God. Never take your eyes off of God. No matter what great accomplishment you do in life, know that God allowed you to do it. Know that God created you to do it. Never walk around thinking, that's all me. I did that. I did that because that's when the enemy gets a foothold. And that's when we begin to decline. Lastly, stay prayed up. Seek him daily. Even when you're feeling bad, seek him. Even when you're feeling great, seek him. Even when you're feeling blah. Lord, I don't think I did anything good today. I messed up in everything. Seek him. The call on your life is too great for you to not take it seriously. We are still on this journey to recovery, journey to rebuild. You see what's going on in society. Now is not the time to back up. Run to Christ. Ask him, Lord, where do you need me? Where are you sending me? Then humble yourself, let go, and let God. Family, the last thing I want to do as we, as we get ready for dismissal, Kenny, if you, if you want to come, you can come. We, we, that's it. I, I can't even try to extend what the Lord has already stopped. That's it. That's all that God has given me. So there's nothing else. I put everything out for you. I pray that this seed be planted in your heart and you recognize the call in your life. Family, parents, I pray you recognize the call in your children's life and you begin to sow into them. God is in need of people who are willing to be an extension of him. God is in need of a, of a, a godly people who's willing to fight back the enemy in the darkness of the world. If that is you, if you feel like God is calling you, I just want to pray at the end for you, corporately. But ultimately, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, after Kenny gets done with a song, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for those who want to get saved. That's nobody perfect. Thank God. Hallelujah. And then we just want to pray for those who want to come up to the altar, who just says, Lord, I, or Carl and I, I feel like God has called me. I feel like God is using me. I wants to use me. I just need some extra prayer. We're just going to pray.